an opportunity, but uh, as far as what they have scheduled, it is 100%. So um, that's uh, a blessing as well. Turn with me in your Bibles tonight to the book of Psalms, chapter 42. Psalm 42. And um, I'll just share a couple of things that I hope will be a blessing to you. Um, How many of you would testify to say when you got saved, when you called on the Lord for salvation... It was, a, it was the greatest blessing of your life, transformational. I mean, it made a world of difference, night and day. Now, I would just say that that's not always the case for everybody. That's not always the case for everybody. Some folks call on the Lord for salvation, and they sputter, and they spit, and they roll around, and they rumble and they grumble and then they don't tend to go anywhere with it and uh, some of them don't go anywhere they end up not even going to church it just kind of you know you wonder what happened there Um, and others seem to take off and 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 shoot up in the air and soar and fly and God just does incredible things in their life and uh, This, I think, is probably one of the, the keys. I mean, there's probably a whole lot of things that are involved in this, but um, what we need is we need a desire for God. We need a hunger and a thirst for God. And if you've not been changed, if, if trusting the Lord for salvation, so oh, I did that, I did that, But if that didn't transform, if that wasn't just life-changing for you, I want to suggest to you that you begin begging God to help you develop a thirst and a hunger for Him. Because when we draw nigh to Him, you cannot stay the same. Your life cannot stay. It must change. Because let's face it, the way we used to be, and maybe sometimes, to at least to some degree, still are, is not compatible with God. Um, I've talked to several people over the last well, several weeks anyway, and um, the common thought that has kept coming up is, it just doesn't seem like, some people are religious, but it does, it's not transformational. And, and the truth of the matter is, here's the truth. There are so many things about our lives that are not godly. And I'm not talking about back when we were lost. I'm talking about now. Everything in our lives needs to be examined, checked, and scrutinized based on what God says. When I got saved, there was a bunch of obvious things in my life that were way out of whack, wrong. I'm thankful that God helped me change those. But over the course of time, God has not just changed the big things. He's changed many of the little things as well. And I'm thankful tonight that he's still working on me. He's not finished yet because I know he's not done There's still a lot that needs to be changed in my heart and life. Psalm chapter 42, I want to look at verses 1 and 2 as as, uh, this psalm is uh, to the chief musician for the sons of Korah. Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, As the heart panteth after the water brooks... So panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? The psalmist here is is saying that there is a thirst inside of the soul for God. And I would say this. 
We all thirst for something. Not all of it is for God, but we're thirsting for something. What are we thirsting for? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so glad tonight to be able to know you, to be able to worship you and come before you and learn of you, and I pray that you would, you would put a thirst in us. I pray that our soul would have a desire that could only be quenched by you and by your presence and by, your, by understanding you and your word, that we might be changed that our lives might be transformed, that there might be a difference that's not just behind the scenes, not just uh, under the skin, so to speak, but that's visible, that's, that's audible, that's, that's seeable by the community around us. So we ask for your help tonight. We live in a wicked world. We're hearing more and more about it all the time. It's encroaching even on us in this small community. And I pray that you'd help us to stand tall, to shine the light brightly, Father, we, if there's no thirsting for the things of God in our hearts, then our, bright, our, our lights will not be that bright. So I pray that you would help us tonight to dip the wick deep into the things of God and bring up that light that comes from a, a relationship with you. We ask for your blessing and we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. How did you learn what you've learned? All right. Now, all of us have different backgrounds, different experiences, different skills. Some of you are teachers. Quite a few of you, in fact, are teachers. How did you become a teacher? A lot of studying, right? A lot of textbook reading. A lot of of. of uh, energy and effort put into that. A lot of thought goes into how am I going to communicate to my students and how am I going to get these, these principles across to them. Some of us garden. And gardening is more than just taking a seed and poking it in the ground or buying a plant and sticking it over there. I mean, you can do that, but you may not be, it may not give you fruit, as we said this morning. We all have different interests and different things that we focus on. I, as you know, I, I have bees, and I, and I, you know, it's 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 you know not for everybody. You know, so how many of you all really have a passion to get out there with the bees? That you already said, huh? get stung. You know, <clears throat> obviously not interested, right? I'm just saying, and you know what? You know how I learned what I learned about bees? I studied. There was something inside of me that says, I need to read a book. There was something inside of me that says, I need to get some bees. There was something inside of me that said, well, I, I need to check this out. I need to look at that. I need to learn this. I need to... And the next thing you know, the honey's flowing. Right? Literally. But how did you... You learn and you know what you know and what you've learned because you put your heart into it. And there are things out there, whether it be bees or, or other things, that you couldn't care any less about. I mean, to save your life, you wouldn't, you know, air up your tire on your car, much less change the oil or, or anything else, right? I'll take it to somebody. I'm just, what you're, in, you know what we need to do? How you got good at whatever it is that you're good at is you got your heart into it. You know, we need to get our heart into it. No matter whether it's we like bees or we like teaching or we like this or that or planting gardens or crafting of some sort, all those other things are fine. But what we really need to get our heart into is the, the things of God. The psalmist here said, as the, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, heart, the rabbit, panteth after water. You know, if, if, you don't, if you don't water your rabbits, they'll die. Just saying. He says, 
just as the, the heart needs water, my soul needs thee, O God. Then he says, my soul thirsteth for God, for the living God, not just the living God. He says, when shall I come and appear before God? And there's a lot more to this psalm, but I just want to have that as an opening thought. You know, there are things that we get interested in and we get enthralled in and we get, uh, we get wrapped up in and we're thirsty and hungry for, hungry for knowledge. I mean, I'm just going to tell you, at, at least once a day, at least once a day, and I'm talking about every day, I do some kind of informational research or something about bees. I'm just going to tell you. That's not somebody who doesn't care about learning. That's somebody who does care about that. All right? But more than once a day, I'm doing some research, doing some thinking, doing some reading, doing some studying on the things of God. The psalmist here points out that our relationship with God is the same as anything else. If our heart's not in it, it's not going anywhere. You will not develop any, in any way a, a relationship with the Lord if it's not a thirsting from your soul and from your heart. All right? And by the way, it doesn't take a college degree to know God. It takes you and a Bible. Right? You don't have to go to college to be a, 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 a theologian. You don't have to go to college to get to know God. Uh, and, and no, all it takes is you and the textbook right here and the Holy Spirit of God that will join you in that. And if your heart's in it, I promise you, God will meet with you there. It doesn't take a college degree, it takes a thirst to get to know God. All right, look with me. We're going to look at a couple of different things uh, this evening, but look, let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, just um, let, me, let, me, let me say this. Mankind, just as a pr general principle, mankind has a thirst for knowing things. I don't know if you knew that. And it's all different things. It's not, you know, everybody's not the same thing. But mankind has a thirst for knowledge. Notice here in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, right? And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. The negative that was attributed there, that was, that was associated there, it's not, it's not so. Now he's a liar, always been a liar, always will be a liar. But notice what he, what he exchanged that with. He said, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, that your, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as God's knowing, knowing, knowing good and evil. And when the psalm, woman saw that the tree was good for food, that was pleasant in the eyes, and a tree be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to, unto her husband with her, and he did eat. What were they, what were they tempted by? Knowing. You want to know something you don't know? I mean, you think about it. Somebody comes along, hey, did you hear about what happens? Our ears tweak, what? There's something I don't know? Right? Yeah. And the, from that blossomed Facebook. <laughs> now we have Facebook. <clears throat> It had to come out, didn't it? It just had to. Anyway, t turn with me to Ecclesiastes, all right? Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Look at Ecclesiastes. Um, in Ecclesiastes chapter number 1, 
we have a thought here starting in verse number 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, starting in verse number 12. Now, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, wrote this. And it says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And notice what he says in verse 13. I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all the things of God. No, that's not what he says. He says, I gave my heart to seek and to search out for, uh, by wisdom concerning all the things that are under heaven. Not in heaven, under heaven. I want to know everything there is to know. Notice this sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. He said, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and hold all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanton cannot be numbered. <laughs> There's so many broken things and messed up things in the world, I can't even number them. He said in verse 16, I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to a great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart uh, had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth, increaseth sorrow. He says it's vanity. The wisest man that ever lived says, I, 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 I got into that for a time. I figured out it wasn't worth my time. It wasn't worth getting into. Okay? <clears throat> Look at uh, the end of the, book, end of the letter there, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Notice with me uh, verses 13 and 14, uh, the last two verses in that, uh, in that uh, letter, that uh, book. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work to judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. He said, here's the, here's the, the grand scheme of everything. Here's the bottom line to the whole uh, enchilada. He says, the whole conclusion of the whole matter is this, let's fear God and keep his commandments. Isn't that what we said already? Isn't that what God said in Deuteronomy 5.29 that he wanted? Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. That's what God said. And Solomon, after all of his efforts, all of his energies, all, of, all the money spent and all the time spent seeking for wisdom and understanding, he says, and I'll give you the bottom line, we need to get to know God and get to know what God says and, and do it. <clears throat> See, mankind has a thirst for knowledge and for knowing. But we tend to quench that thirst with things that don't matter, with things of, of lesser value. And again, there's, is there anything wrong with keeping bees? No, no, there's not. Is there anything wrong with, with uh, planting a garden or, or uh, many of the other things? No, nothing wrong with those things. But what we miss is... We get consumed by all the other things out there. And we miss the very most important thing, the most life-changing thing that there is. A relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. A daily, personal, life-changing relationship. And because we get mingled and messed up in all the rest of that, now think about this for a moment. Because we get mingled up and messed up in all the rest of that, we tend to get tripped up. We tend to, to, to get messed up. Now think about this. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, and he didn't get that wisdom by seeking and searching out in the world. God gave it to him. But that wasn't enough. Even everything that God gave him, it wasn't enough. It didn't sat satisfy uh, his desire for knowledge and wisdom. He said, i got to have more. It's an insatiable desire, unquenchable even. But now think about this. 
Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, sought after wisdom, searched out all over the planet, everything under the sun, the wisest man that ever lived fell in, in the basest of ways because he put his priorities in the wrong places. He was supposed to be second in the line of a long line of kings that would never come down from the throne. And instead, he stumbled and fell, and every king in the line after him stumbled and fell. Let me, uh, let me direct you to Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. I was just going to read this, but I think, I think it'd be a, a good one for us all to read. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6. If you found it, say amen. Okay, I'll give you another second. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, I want, you, I want to contrast that verse with what we just found out about Solomon. Given wisdom by God beyond, uh, beyond anybody else, but it wasn't quenchable. He sought more and sought more until he finally said, you know what, this is silly. It ended up destroying him. But God says this, you will be happy, you will be satisfied if you will hunger and thirst after righteousness and you will be filled. You know, just a, a quick thing about bees from the time, well, beekeeping has gone back, way back in the Bible, you can find beekeeping, and way back in history. They've dug up honey in Egypt that's been buried in the tombs down there, and it's still edible. Okay? I'm just saying, beekeeping's been around a long time. So you'd think, after all these centuries of having beekeeping and bees, we'd already know everything there is to know. But you know what? There's something new pops up on YouTube every day. There's something new written about bees every day. I'm just saying it's endless. And so is every other thing out there, right? All, all the different things that we can search for and do, there's just so many, many things that we can, and we'll never be quenched by it. But he says, if you want to be satisfied, study and seek and search out the things of God. We will be happy, blessed, when we turn our desire to know up, uh, uh, upon the knowledge uh, of God and, the, and, and have our desires filled by seeking and searching out the things of God. Now let me give you a second thought tonight. A thirst for God is not something that somebody else can or will do for you. You can tell me great food or good. I, I don't believe you. And you will probably never convince me. And until I start eating those things for myself, not likely, I will never have an appetite for them. Now, if you told me I'd lose 10 pounds this week, if I ate some, I might eat some this week. But if I didn't lose 10 or 11 pounds in the process, I might quit eating them next week. I'm just... I'm just saying. Thirsting for God is not something that I can put in you or that anybody can put in you. It has to be something that comes from you. Just like the, the psalmist there that we read in Psalm 42, you know, he, he said that it, it was coming from his heart. It was in his soul. The heart, as the heart panteth for the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul, my soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When, I, uh, when shall I come and appear before God? He had a desire to know God and to be in the presence of God. 
All right, now think about this. When Adam and Eve sought to fill their desire for knowledge, they sought it apart from God. God had already told them about it. He told them about those things. They didn't believe it. They thought, no, we're going to check some other resources. We're going to get another opinion. It's a good thing YouTube wasn't around back then, or they'd have got a whole lot of other opinions, right? And apart, because they sought knowledge apart from God, they ended up leaving God, didn't they? They ended up leaving the garden, leaving the presence of God. Our priorities oftentimes are imbalanced. And then as a result, our lives do not demonstrate the things of God. I'm in Psalm, I'm going to look at Psalm 63. I'm going to look at two verses there, verses 1 and 2. David here writing says, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Verse number 2, Psalm 63, 2. To see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, he said, I want to get to know you. I want to be a part of you. I want to, I want to get close to you. I want to be around you. Now consider and, 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 and think about this. When Judas, jumping forward in time to the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples, when Judas got tired of seeing Jesus' miracles, he turned him in. When, when that did not satiate him, when that did not satisfy him, when that, he said, man, we've got to go beyond this uh, feeding of, uh, of people and, and uh, healing of sick. We need something done. He turned the Lord in. Maybe, and it has been thought uh, assumed, if you will, that he was trying to force Jesus to reveal his true identity and set up his kingdom. I don't know what his heart's desire was, but I know it wasn't genuine. So we should never become impatient with God and, the, and getting to know the things of God. We should always, uh, we, we should never tire of, of growing closer to the Lord and seeking the Lord. Well, I read my Bible through, and, and so that's good enough. It's not good enough. I've read my Bible through every year for years, and I'll read it again next year. And I'll read it again the year after that, if the Lord tarries. I've been challenged with the thought. Some folks read it through many, many times every year, multiple times a year. I'm afraid my, that's going too fast for my brain, but I, I'm tempted to try it. I mean, what can it hurt? If the Lord tarries another couple of years, I'll, I'll have, an, I, if it doesn't work for me, I'll try something else. But we need to desire to see God working around us, do we not? How about you? But I want to see God working around me. There's nothing like seeing souls saved. There's nothing like seeing, I mean, the, even the simple thing of, of people coming to church, visitors coming to church, that's exciting to me. Hey, the light's shining and people are coming to the light. Praise the Lord for that. Seeing people have their lives changed getting their questions answered and, and, and moving on for the thing, in the things of the Lord. Turn with me to another psalm, Psalm 143, verses 6 and 7. Psalm 143, verses 6 and 7. I'll give you a third thought right here. What we need is we need a desire to be in the presence of God like David, like Psalm 42 there, the sons of Korah. We need to, uh, like David did, a desire to see God working in and around our lives. Psalm 40, uh, 143, 
verses 6 and 7, we need a realization of our own need for God to intervene in our life. Do you need God's intervention? I do. I need God to do something in my life. Notice the psalm of Psalm of David here. He says in verse number 6, I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee. As a thirsty land, Salah means think about that. He said, I'm reaching out to you, God. I'm stretching out to you. I'm, I'm hungry for you. I'm thirsty for you. Uh, I, I need something from you. Verse 7, hear me speedily, O Lord. My spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. God, if you don't intervene, I will be lost. I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do without you. What do people do when they're put in a position where they seem or feel hopeless or helpless? They often cry out to God, don't they? Even atheists do that. We need to, you know, it shouldn't take situations of desperation to get us to this place. But oftentimes it takes situations of desperation to get us into this place. But do you realize if we didn't wait for those situations of desperation to where we're reaching out to God and we just went ahead and reached out to him all the time, we'd probably find that we weren't in situations of desperation nearly as often. I hope you followed all that. I'll tell you a real quick story right here. A couple years ago, it was, I think it was my second year of beekeeping. I think that's what it was. I went out to the bee yard one day, and I popped the top off the bees, and I started looking, and all of a sudden something happened. They got mad. And they started coming out of the box, and they started attacking me. I mean, I got 50-some stings that, in that small amount of time. And if you think one sting hurts, try getting 50-some. Unpleasant. I just left them. I thought, man, if this is the way this is, I'm not sure that I'm continuing. I went back in the house. I sat at the computer, and I started searching for something. I, I just got stung 50 times, and guess what? I found out that lots of other people on that day or the day before had gotten stung the same. I mean, just attacked. And I thought, okay, it's not just me. <clears throat> I'm going to have to man up. I'm going to have to go out there. I'm going to have to show these bees what it's all about. And I took a deep breath. And I went out there and I, you know, did what I had to do and put them back together. And I didn't get one more sting. But I'll tell you right now, all them stings got me searching for answers. But I wish I'd known that morning what I had learned that afternoon. And I could have avoided a whole lot of pain. Turn with me to Psalm 84, and let me give you a fourth thought right here. What we need is a desire that comes from within, not from without. I've kind of already mentioned this. Nobody can do this for you. This is something you have to do for yourselves. This has to be something that comes from within you. Psalm 84, starting in verse number 1 in the Psalm of, of uh, 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 the sons of Korah again, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself. Where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Notice he says, my King, my God. Verse 4, blessed are they that dwell in thy house, they uh, will be uh, still praising thee, Selah. 
Verse number 5. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, and whose heart are the ways of them. And in whose heart are the ways of them. In the ways of what? In the ways of of thee in, 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 in God's ways. You know, this desire that we're talking about, you know, you can, you can look at somebody's life and you can see, man, this person, he heard the same information that this person heard. There's two people that hear the same message, but one responds to it and the other just kind of blows it off and nothing's done with it. What's the difference? The difference is the heart that it landed in. It, it, it's like the, the, the parable of the sower and the seeds. It's, it's all in the soil that that seed lands in. And I would just ask you, who's in control of your heart? Now, I can't change your heart. There's only one heart that I can do anything about, and I realize that's limited as well, but I'm the only one that can do anything about my heart. And you're the only one that can do anything about your heart. I've mentioned uh, in the past, <clears throat> I, I preached for the Boy Scouts, and I mentioned I preached that message here the week before that, and I was talking about Brussels sprouts and spinach. Boy, I got the same face here that I got over there when I talked about it. Some folks was like, yeah, yeah, give me some, and others like, no, nah, you can have mine. Right? What's the difference? You know, I, I, think, I think about my young people and if you serve Brussels sprouts tonight at the table, there would be some of the young people sitting at my table that would try to steal their neighbor's Brussels sprouts or their neighbor's spinach. And I'm talking about cooked spinach. What's the difference? It's all in what we develop a taste for. You know, I, I have to chuckle. Some of my young people, I'm not going to divulge names, but some of my young people, there have been times that they, man, I don't like noodles. Mm, I don't want noodles. They love noodles today. There are some folks, some of them that didn't like potatoes. They love potatoes today. What changed? Just their appetite. Once you convinced them, no, 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 go ahead and taste that. It's okay. Taste it when it's hot, not after it's been there an hour. I don't know of anything that tastes better after an hour of sitting on the plate. I remember one night sitting at the, at the dining room table, and one of my younger boys, his sister turned away, and he reached over and stabbed her whole pile of spinach and shoved it in his mouth before she could even respond to him. Stole it right off of her plate. No one made him like spinach. Hey, and he didn't even know who Popeye was at the time. <laughs> this wasn't even a false hope type deal. <laughs> but he had a desire for that. And to this day, he keeps eating stuff like that. You know what I want? I want a desire, I want a hunger and thirst like that for the things of God. And can I tell you it will make a difference in your life? If your appetite is quenched with sweets, you're probably not going to like spinach and all that stuff like that. If our appetites are wetted by the world we're probably not going to have an appetite for the things of God. And you're the only one that can do anything about that. I can talk about it, I can preach about it, I can mention it, but you're the only one that can do anything about it. 
I mentioned the bookstore. I mentioned the, the Bible studies that are down there. I mentioned the d- daily devotional things that are down there. I mentioned, you know, having daily devotions as a family. Parents, by the way, my kids like Brussels sprouts and broccoli and, and, and cauliflower and, and um, you know, um, spinach and things of that nature. Why? Because I serve it to them as a young person. It's on their plate from the time that they can feed themselves and sometimes before that. You know what? I need to make sure they got spiritual nourishment as well. Because if I don't feed them spiritually when they're young, they're probably not going to have an appetite for it when they're old. Parents, that's on us. Okay? I mean, if, if my kids got to sit around every day watching the cartoons, they probably wouldn't be too interested in listening to Daddy talk about the Scriptures. I'm not saying they never get to watch the other stuff or participate in some of the other stuff. But sometimes they'll come to say, Dad, can we watch something on TV tonight? Yeah, pick something spiritual and you can watch it. That's, that's my, you know, yeah, we can watch something, but it has to be something that builds up, edifies spiritually. All right? I'm just throwing this out there for hopefully it'll help you because I want them to develop an appetite for those things. Because if they just get to sit around and flip the channels and watch whatever they want to watch out there, there's enough out there that they, they won't have a hunger and thirst for the right stuff anymore. So be careful with that. And by the way, it's the same with us as adults. We need to be careful what we're watching, what we're involving ourselves in, what we're feeding our appetites and developing a taste for, because it will ruin our appetite for the things of God. What are you hungry for? What are you thirsting for? Let's stand together and have prayer tonight. Man, the time flies by, doesn't it? Time just flies by. The question tonight before us is, what are you hungering and thirsting for? And, the, and, and, and obviously the choices are either I'm hungering and thirsting for the things of the world or I'm hungering and thirsting for the things of God. And I would just suggest to you that if, you're, if, if tonight, and, and you have to evaluate yourself, not only can I not develop in you an appetite for the things of God, I can't change that for you. I can just tell you about it. But if you see that need, then you have to do something about that. Yes, pray. Lord, help me to develop this appetite. But then you need to quench it. You need to start indulging in those things and don't don't hesitate you know i didn't even know i liked brussels sprouts until i was an adult my wife told somebody the other day <clears throat> when we left for italy years ago i told her i didn't even like lasagna but i was going to italy well i came back loving lasagna especially my wife's lasagna. So sometimes we just need to dig in, and the appetite will come. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you for your love for us and for your patience with us. I pray that tonight as you speak to our hearts, as you guide and direct in the next moments, as your Holy Spirit moves in our midst, that you would help us to to have a hungry and thirsting, that you would... uh, even put a desire in there and, and draw us to it and help us and encourage us by the Holy Spirit tonight that we might develop that hungering and that thirsting, that appetite for the things of God. And the Father, we might uh, find even conviction uh, when, we, when we start reaching out for and seeking out for and, and participating in the, 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 the other things, and not all of them are bad, but Father, we tend to crowd out the right things. And so I pray for your help tonight that we might develop a right thirsting and a right hungering and that our relationship with you might grow and develop and that uh, others might even be able to see that in our lives. And we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. What's our song tonight?